Hello. Hello. <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to like obviously talk to you about worship, but one of my, I'm going to give you a few tips here and there about how to be a good worshiper, <laughs> which may sound weird. Um, I'll start off, I love worship. It's my, one of my most favorite parts of coming to church, obviously, playing the piano and singing. But I was not always a good worshiper. And I'll explain more about that later, why I didn't consider myself to be a good worshiper. So to dive into this, let's first talk about the word worship. Okay, the word worship in grammar is considered a gerund, which means that the same word can mean both noun and a verb. So in the dictionary, the noun form of the word worship means reverence offered to a divine being or supernatural power. So what is the verb? The verb means to show reverence to the divine being or supernatural power. Now sometimes I think it is easy to forget or to brush off that we need to not only honor God by coming to church, but we need to honor God with our bodies. In ways such as clapping our hands, singing, bowing, lifting our hands, kneeling, shouting, dancing, and even standing in awe. All these things bring glory to God. Plus, our physical actions and body language says what our words cannot. Just like when you pat a friend or a coworker on the shoulder when they've done a good job, or when, say, the grown-ups are talking and a child reaches up to the mother or father to pick them up. Nothing is said, with, but the meaning is known. Nothing, um, now, you may be saying, does God really care if I clap my hands? And my answer is yes. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 19 through 20 says this. Do you not know that your bodies are a temple for the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Jesus, God's only son, died on a cross that you and I would have the opportunity to have an intimate relationship with God the Father. So yes, it is important that we show it in worship how thankful we are for his sacrifice with both our voices and our physical actions. Which leads me to my first point. When this church was started, we were located in the Wilmerding Castle. I don't know how many of you were there. <laughs> it was in a little room, and my dad would play his guitar, Ponce would be on a little drum set, and I had a 25 note keyboard, <laughs> very tiny. <laughs> and for years, it ne worship never felt like worship to me. I never felt like I could get into it. And I would blame the music, I would blame the keyboard, or for the way my dad would play a song, because he tends to change the words. <laughs> and to me, it was just music. And as the years went on, the Lord worked on me. And the more and more, I realized it should not matter the equipment, the lights, the slides, the instruments we have, or how many people are in the church that day. I came here to worship the Lord, and that's what I need to do. Before Jesus' death, in order to meet with the God that we come to meet here every Sunday, you had to dress in a certain garb, kill an innocent animal, or wear bear bells into the holies of holies to make sure that you didn't die. After his death, the veil to the holy of holies was torn, which meant any one of us can approach our God and come to a little old place like this in East McKeesport to meet with an almighty God that works miracles. See, all those years I let everything get in the way, and I thought if God really wanted me to worship, he would make me. I was waiting for something extravagant to happen, and in my mind, I thought that he would make me to do it because he was God and he was just so great, so he would make me. And if he wants us to worship, um, he's going to make me do it, and he can do everything, right? But here's what I missed. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need my worship. I need to worship him. 
and thirst for him and reach for him because the stronger relationship I have with him, the better off I will be in the end. And that's when I finally realized that worship is not a moment you wait for. It is a decision that you make. See, nobody can make you worship. I figured that out. Just last year, when I went to the National Worship Leaders Conference for the very first time, I was very overwhelmed. It was my first time traveling on my own. I drove four hours by myself. I had never driven anywhere over an hour away on my own, let alone across the state border, <laughs> which was weird. And on top of that, I lost, got lost trying to find my hotel. I passed the entrance right up and got stuck on this major highway right out of Washington, D.C. So I was just really, you know, all over the place. So a lot of things were distracting me. And when I finally got to the worship service, which I hadn't been to one in a very long time, I find, found myself focusing more on the music and judging the musicians, saying, ooh, that's a nice keyboard, I should get that, you know? Doing all those sorts of things, I found myself focusing on the music and the production than on actually worshiping God. I was trying to take it all in and I finally had to check myself and say, hey, that's not why you're here. You need to focus on him. And when I did, that was when the true worship set in. I had to make that decision to worship because I wanted more of what he had for me, which is proof right there that no one can make you worship. I was in the perfect setting, the perfect setting. These are the top worship leaders. They teach other worship leaders how to do it. They had the perfect lights, the perfect slides. They had smoke, the perfect musicians, no new songs, everything. I mean, the lights on the walls even matched the colors on the slides. Like, I was just amazed by that. And I was still able to check out and not focus and not receive what the Lord had for me at that time. Now, you may be saying, how do you get there? How how do you get to actually worshiping? And my answer is baby steps and practice. <laughs> All good relationships take time and effort. It's the same thing with your relationship with God. If you've never sang before, try it out. Maybe whisper or sing the parts that you know. When you sing, you are pleasing God by obeying his commandments. Colossians 3.16 says this, Let the word of Christ Dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness on our hearts to God. And did you know that when you sing, you build other people up? You never know who your worship will impact around you. Who's watching? Is it your grandkids? Maybe the person who just came here for the first time? You never know who's watching which kind of leads me to a song I did today. <laughs> and I didn't even realize it. How great is our God? How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? And all will see how great, how great is our God. All will see how great he is through your singing. <laughs> it's kind of amazing if you think about it that way. Now, I will lead you the best way I can, but only you can make that decision to worship. You may be thinking, well, Becky over there hears me singing, and she's so judgmental. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but when I... <laughs> she's really not. That was just a joke. <laughs> but, you know, you may be self-conscious about your singing, but <laughs> in the end, when you get to heaven, I highly doubt that God's going to say, oh, yeah, Becky, she's so judgmental. I wouldn't have sang either. <laughs> You know, so if that's what, if that is um, a hold up for you with singing and lifting your voice to the Lord, maybe that's something that you need to put in the back of your mind, that darn Becky. <laughs> it's always said that it takes two people to make a relationship work. So why do we feel differently about a relationship with God? Another thing to point out is anything you want to succeed at in your life needs practice, right? That doesn't exclude worship. Here's an example. How many of you are sports fans? 
Raise your hand. Okay. Now, how many of you watch the games at home? There you go. Have you ever gone to a live game if you watch them at home? You had the chance? So you know what it's like. Those of you who have gone to a live game, you know what it's like to be in that setting where everyone's just so excited and you can feel the energy the second you walk in that stadium. Why are they excited? Anybody know? Everyone else is, right? Right, right. So they're excited because they finally get to be face-to-face -face with the team they've been watching at home, and now they can let it all out and not feel weird about it, right? <laughs> and everyone in that room is rooting for one of those two teams. Watching those games at home is like practice for the big day. You know, you cheer a little bit at home, but not like you do when you're at the live game. <laughs> so that's what it should be like when you come to church. As a Christ follower in this world today, where everything is so wrong, Sunday morning should be your favorite game, where we can openly praise and worship our God with other fans of the King, and not feel judged or uncomfortable. Church is perfect because it's not weird here. You know, you can sing and shout, and it's not weird because we all know what you're doing. We're all voting for the same team. I don't know about you, but I love to see people worship. Just like I said before, it builds people up. And sometimes when the whole church is singing the same song to our Lord, I can't help, I, I have to hold back the tears <laughs> and actually stop singing because I can't handle it. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so how do I practice, you say? Well, here's a question for you. What music are you listening to during the week? <laughs> is the music you're listening to filling you with desires of this world? Or are you filling yourself with the gospel and the hope and the love that is found in Jesus Christ? Is your music gearing you up for Sunday when you finally get to be here with other fans? Are you reading your Bible and spending time in prayer? Those play a big role in what happens here on Sunday. Which gives me my next point. The more you worship at home and meet with God behind closed doors, the easier it becomes to find him here. It doesn't become weird and awkward anymore. You won't feel anxious and impatient saying, oh my gosh, this song's taking way too long. Because you know how to find him. You've done it before. You just did it yesterday when you read your Bible. You were there. You know how to meet him. So finding him will become second nature, and you won't have to think as hard, and you can just focus on receiving whatever he has for you that day. One thing I want to touch on, and I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> Who here has been late to church or coming at the end of worship, specifically the end of worship? <laughs> yeah, yeah, anybody? It, don't be shy. We've all done it. It's, yeah, I've done it. <laughs> so... We're talking about having a relationship with God and having conversations with him and getting to know him. Have you ever gone to a party and you see someone you've met maybe once or twice, an acquaintance, you don't know much about him, you probably can't even remember the face? You guys ever been there? And these people will come up to you and you don't remember them and they start just telling you the whole life story. Have you ever had that happen? And you're like, whoa, man, way too much information. Like, I can't even remember your first name. So, and you think to yourself, slow down, buddy. I'm not there yet. <laughs> That's what it's like when you come into worship late. They've gotten, when you arrive early, the people you see here that are in worship and singing and praying and doing whatever they're doing, because most of the time my eyes are closed. The people who arrive early have already gotten past the hellos and the how have you beens with God. They've already gotten deep and eased their way into that conversation. So it no longer feels awkward for them because they've already done it. When you come in at the end, that's like diving into that deep conversation with somebody that you barely know. So that's just something you want to keep in mind. It's no longer awkward because they've gotten familiar with one, other, one another. If you want more out of worship and want a deeper relationship with the Lord, 
I urge you to not only come in with the right mindset and to focus on the Lord, but to come on time so you can get past the awkward. (laughs) You'll be amazed what doing those two things will do. I'll leave you with this. Bill Johnson said this, Worshiping God on earth is one of the hardest things you will ever do. We live in a world where literally everything is made to go against, distract you from what we're doing here on Sundays. What my father said last week, the enemy is there to discourage, distract, and destroy, right? He's going to do anything he can, make you late, dump your coffee on the floor, your car break down. He's going to do anything he can to make you not focus on the Lord when you come here on Sunday. When you come here and worship, I swear it makes the devil cringe. And I don't know about you, but I'm happy when he's cringing. (laughs) I think that's why one of Jesus' prayers is, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because in heaven it is constant worship. And that's what Jesus wanted to see us all turning to God. The very reason he gave his life. And that's my prayer, too, that we learn to worship with abandon. We come through that door every Sunday. That's all I have.